talking about is dealing with units and this whole dimensional analysis setup. Okay? And a lot of people just fight it because they aren't used to thinking like this. They aren't used to saying, well, the units will solve it for you. They just don't see that, which is okay. So let's take a look at just two questions. How many moles are in 9.8 grams of calcium? How many grams are in 2.3 moles of calcium? Just that's it. Two questions. Each of those is just a single conversion. Right, so relatively straightforward. The standard method for the first question is I would memorize that mass divided by molar mass equals moles. It's true. Okay, that works. For the second question, I also have to memorize that moles times molar mass equals grams. I also have to memorize that the molar mass can be found on, whoops, oh, where to find the molar mass, can be found on the periodic table. So for those two questions, I have to memorize three things. Well, three things, I can memorize that. It's not a big deal. Right? Well, and it's totally not my method, but I didn't have a better way of describing it. How we've been talking about solving these, okay, I need to remember dimensional analysis, okay, write down the units, and I need to remember where to find molar mass. So two questions, I memorize two things. Two questions. The way you're typically taught, you memorize three. Like, well, I can memorize three things, Mike. It's not that hard. Okay? That's just two questions. Okay? Your exam is 35 questions. Doing it my way, you memorize two things. Doing it your way, you memorize 36 things. Okay? your load on memorization now becomes much, much, much heavier if you don't have a process like dimensional analysis to go through and set it up. Okay. And again, ultimately, I shouldn't be really denigrating memorization because memorization is important. When I go to the doctor, I expect them to be able to have symptoms memorized for common illnesses so that when I go in, they're like, well, the combination of those symptoms means this illness. Not I go in and list their symptoms, and then I come back a week later for them to tell me what that illness is. So memorization is important. And regardless of where you're going to go, you will need to have stuff memorized. But where are you going to go that you need to memorize mass divided by molar mass equals moles? How many of you are going to become chemistry majors? Okay. So your argument then for memorization is that it is so critical to do well on the exam that you have to memorize tons of information. You're now using brain power to store information that you will never use again. Meanwhile, you're probably also taking another class. What does that other class require? Memorization. Memorization, meaning more brain power. You don't have an infinite amount of brain power. Right? So the idea is to classify things and only memorize things that you absolutely have to hold on to. Right? This is chemistry. Mass divided by molar mass equals moles. That's true. Right? I will completely grant you that. Right? And this is a chemistry class. So I do expect you to be able to show me that you can come up with that. But I don't expect you to memorize it. I expect you to recognize the process for how to solve it. Okay? Notice in this Mike's method column, there's no calculation written out. Okay? Because I don't have to write out the calculation. Because I can follow the process. The process will allow me to solve any question. And the part that I have to memorize is now where do I find the information to allow me to do that conversion? Okay? So it is really your choice. Right? Admittedly, I lose my mind a little bit if you want to go through the standard memor memorization route. Okay? So if you go through and ask me, well, to get moles, I have to divide by molar mass. I will f flip out. Okay? Sorry. Okay? One of the reasons why I'll flip out is you're now asking me a question that I literally do not know the answer to. Like, really? You're a chemist, and you don't know that mass divided by molar mass equals moles. No, I don't, because that's not useful information to memorize. Dimensional analysis is useful information. The process to allow me to solve that question 
is helpful and useful and allows me to actually get to answers. Okay? So I'm not going to spend my brain power to memorize an equation that ultimately doesn't get me anything. It gets me one answer. Okay? Meanwhile, I'm spending brain power to memorize that and not memorize your name. Okay? How many of you appreciate it when you walk into the classroom and the teacher's like, hey, you, yeah, you, what's the answer to this question? This was Isaiah tell me the answer. Okay. You're probably like, I prefer the hey you, because then I can pretend you aren't pointing at me. Okay. So I decided that it doesn't make sense to go through and do that memorization process. Okay. I'm also not a doctor. I don't have to do that diagnosing. Okay. Because my memory sucks, I'd be a horrible doctor. I'd say, oh, yeah, those are your symptoms? Okay. I'll let you know in a week. Right? No one's going to come visit me as a doctor. Right? So depending on where you're going, you need to be thinking about what's that ultimate goal? What do I want out of an individual? Not just this class, but every class. What am I trying to get out of it? Why am I being told I have to take a communications class? Right? Do you need to communicate with people in your future job? Yes. Well, maybe you need a communications class. Okay. Well, I can communicate just fine without a communications class. Possibly. Will a communications class make you better? Theoretically, it should. Okay. Same kind of idea with chemistry. It is important to be able to see those chemical relationships if you're moving into any kind of field that involves medicine. Okay. Or even measurements. Because that's what chemistry is doing. We're talking about those measurements and how to manipulate those. So it becomes very, very important. But the nitty-gritty detail of what are those conversions and what are those measurements, not so much. Because okay? when you walk out of here, you're probably never going to look at moles again. Okay? Which is a sad, sad day. But that is OK. Kind of makes sense? So again, dimensional analysis minimizes the memorization. Okay? If you choose to not use that method, then you had better memorize really well how to set those equations up. And remember, what you have to memorize is not just what I punch into the calculator, but you need to prove to me that those units cancel out. So it's what are the units on mass? What are the units on molar mass? How do those cancel in that calculation? <laughs> Because you can't just say, well, in this case, 9.8 divided by, where is it, 40.08. Numerically, that's correct, but that says nothing about the units. You haven't proven to me you understand what's happening with the units. Or even what that calculation meant. So minimally, you'd have to include the units in that. And then I'd still probably get mad because I knew what you were doing. Okay? But I can't take off points because you did it right. So it's just me. Yeah, you're just kicking me in the stomach. Okay. Metaphorically. Please don't do that physically. Tall enough that you probably can. Okay. Make sense? Okay. So, gases. This is where it gets fun because we really have to pull in some memorization stuff here. So if you've spent your time memorizing those silly formulas, when we move into new concepts where you actually have to memorize concepts, you're again destroying that brain power or limiting the brain power for other questions. Okay, so ideal gases. So we talked about when we think about humans, we look at the ideal scenario. We don't assume everybody's mass murderers because then we would never leave our house. Okay? We would probably even born day one be like, who the hell is that creepy person holding on to me? Get me away from them. And we'd all be extremely excluded from everybody. We would never make any connections. Okay. So we look at the ideal system and we make the assumption that people aren't going to hurt us, okay. or at least minimally hurt us at calculated risks. Okay. We do the same thing with gases. We go through and say, well, what would an ideal gas do? Okay. Not a real gas, but in an ideal circumstance, what are the things that would allow me to make models of their behaviors? So one of the assumptions that we go through and make is that we say gases are super tiny particles. 
Well, is that true? Yeah, okay. They are super tiny particles. In fact, so are solids and so are liquids. Okay. But we take this a step further with our gases. Okay. We take it so far into saying they're super tiny particles that I say an individual particle has no volume. Well, that doesn't make that big a deal, right? Okay. <clears throat> Let's treat humans as gas particles. When you walk in here, where could you sit? Isaiah says he could sit anywhere. Okay. Presumably because, well, let's work with it. Were you the first one here? I was the second one. Okay, dang it. First. We've got first. Okay. Where could she sit? Anywhere. anywhere. Where could Isaiah sit, being second one in the classroom? Almost anywhere. Almost anywhere. But... Where could he not sit? Well, appropriately, where could he not sit? <laughs> where is she sitting? <clears throat> Why can't he sit there? That volume is occupied already. Okay. She has volume. Okay. What we're making the assumption with gases is that when Isaiah walks into the room, where can he sit? Literally anywhere. You mean exactly where she's sitting? Yes. Okay. That's the assumption we make with gases. Does that make physical sense in the real world? No. no. Because she's there. He can't sit there. But what are gases doing? They are constantly moving. They have insanely high kinetic energy, which means when Isaiah walks in, by the time he decides, I'm going to sit where she's sitting, what has she already done? She's moved. She's moved. So could Isaiah sit there? Yes. Yes. Okay. So because our particles are moving so much, we have open access to the entire volume. Okay. That ends up being not true. Okay. And we could go through and evaluate the conditions on how that would affect everything. But it makes the mathematics a nightmare. So what do we do? We say, well, I'm going to ignore that because I don't want to deal with mathematics. I want to deal with a simplified system. So we make an assumption, no volumes. Other kind of random things. Our gas molecules demonstrate rapid motion in straight lines. Which, again, if we were particles, does that make sense? Because I can move, right, in a straight line. But what can I do right now? Turn. Turn. What caused me to turn? I did. Gases can't do that. Gases can walk in a straight line until what? They hit something. Until they hit something. <coughs> what have they now done to that something? Collided. They've collided it against it. They've pushed it. They've exerted a force on that container. Right? That's our pressure, by the way, which we'll encounter again. Right? But as soon as I collide, now what happens? I can change direction now. Okay? And let's assume I was a little bit. And now I've collided against something else. I can again change direction. So I can only move in straight line motion. Why? It again simplifies how I look at my calculations or how I look at those gases. Okay? The other thing, gas molecules have no attraction for one another. Okay? Does that make sense in the real world? You walk through the world, and your attraction for every other person around you is identical. You're like, that's going to get really freaky really fast. Yes. Okay? Scale it the other direction. <laughs> Don't go in the affectionate direction. Go and say the neutral direction. Okay? And now you have the same interaction with everybody around you. The interaction you have with me is the same interaction you have with everybody. Okay? It's kind of a lonely world. Okay? So we do get different interactions depending on our particles. Okay? But we're going to assume that they don't. Okay? They all have the same interaction. Because as soon as they get different interactions, things go wonky. Okay? Gas molecules will collide without losing energy. Okay? If I run into the wall, typically what happens? I lose energy and I stop moving because that would hurt. Okay? You don't see me run into the wall and then come bouncing off at the exact same speed. 
Okay? That would be kind of funny, but it doesn't happen okay? because we lose energy. We're going to lose energy at the atomic level too, but the amount of energy we're losing is so small that we ignore it. Okay? So we assume elastic collisions. That assumption is also made in physics, by the way. And then the average kinetic energy for your molecules in that solution are proportional to temperature. The hotter it gets, the more the particles move. Okay? So, when you put all of these assumptions together, we end up with this big thing in brackets or in a box, which ends up being a really important thing for you to unfortunately memorize. Okay? I find it insanely offensive to memorize it. I, I do actually find it offensive. Okay? So why might I find it offensive? What are we relating here? Moles to liters. Have we already done that? Yeah, what did we do it for? Ooh, that's a harder question, isn't it? When did we relate moles to liters? Molarity. And when did we have a molarity? When we had a solution, when we had something dissolved in a solvent. Okay? Typically, we looked at it for water, when we had aqueous solutions. Okay? That numerical value will change depending on how much stuff you dissolved in the water. So you could end up with a concentration that is very, very tiny, out beer, or a concentration that is very, very high, vodka. Okay? So the numerical value changes all over the place, depending on what you're looking at. Why is this one different? What happens to the numerical values when I change the substance? Doesn't change. These numerical values are constant. That's kind of cool, right? Because it does stay constant. But when does that constant apply? So we said molarities, it relates moles and liters, but the number's changed all the time. Why is the number all of a sudden being constant? This is only true when looking at a gas. If I'm looking at a solution, this isn't true anymore. Okay? So already I'm going to have a problem with it because I'm saying memorize this equality because it's, it's not always true. It's only true when I'm looking at a gas. Okay? So you're now telling me I should memorize something that has exceptions to it, okay? which we've addressed already in this class with, say, solubility rules. The instant there's exceptions, your instructor stops memorizing it because that means I have to memorize both the rule and all the exceptions. That sucks. Okay. <clears throat> so, gas. Well, that's not so bad. So every gas then, one mole of it will equal 22.4 liters. What was one mole, by the way? What measurement type is a mole? Is it a mass? No. Is it a volume? Time. It's a quantity. It's a count. Okay? That's what I've been calling it, at least in this class. It's a count. Okay? A count of what? Particles. Of particles. Okay? So if we looked at oxygen gas, one mole of oxygen gas would be 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of oxygen gas. Okay? So we could do that. And that would then equal 22.4 liters. Well, is that always true? So whenever you see inequality, you should look for anything that kind of stands out, like big bold letters saying gas, okay? or perhaps like in asterisks and footnotes and small fonts. Those usually stand out. Okay? But this one I'm extra irritated at, so I didn't put a footnote or small fonts or anything. What did I include? Right, and I said in parentheses, when at STP. So that's only true when at a Stone Temple Pilots concert. No. It's not really useful. What is STP? Standard temperature and pressure. Okay, so that is only true when I'm at standard temperature and pressure. Okay, well, what is standard temperature and pressure? What is standard temperature? What do you think would be a good standard temperature? 
Room temperature. What temperature are we likely going to run all of our reactions at? Room temperature. So that would make a lot of sense for a standard temperature. Is that standard temperature? No. What is standard temperature? Zero degrees. Zero degrees Celsius. What's that? 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Or 273 degrees Kelvin. When was the last time you were at zero degrees Celsius? Living back home. In Arizona, maybe if you went up to Flagstaff, I did that right, not Tucson. Maybe if you went up to Flagstaff, maybe you got to zero degrees Celsius, but I don't even think Flagstaff gets to six, zero degrees Celsius. Oh, it does? Oh, okay. Oh, wait, I'm thinking the other way. I'm thinking Fahrenheit. Yes, of course it gets to zero degrees Celsius. Sorry, my bad. Yeah, okay. I was thinking zero degrees Fahrenheit. That it probably doesn't do. Okay, but in any case, freezing point, yes, it does. Okay, because we get snow. Okay, so is this true then in Phoenix? We're never going to get to zero degrees Celsius here, which means one mole of any gas does not equal 22.4 liters for us because we're not at standard temperature. So you're telling me to memorize a relationship that is not true for where I currently am standing. Why? When would I use it? When do I have to use this conversion factor? I have to use it when I'm taking a test. Because on the test, what will I tell you? That you're at standard temperature. Okay? So we're telling you a conversion factor to memorize so that we can test you on whether you memorized it or not. Really? Yes. Okay? So, standard temperature. The next thing that I want to throw in that I find extra irritating about standard temperature, okay, we said zero degrees Celsius didn't make sense because we don't work at zero degrees Celsius. We work at room temperature. Okay, my wife and I were working on an instrument that she uses at work okay, where they were testing the flow rates of different gases into a reactor, okay, and they were trying to determine the amount, and they were troubleshooting why they weren't getting the proper amount. She She's an engineer, makes solar cells now. Um, at the time, she was working on making LEDs. And so they were trying to figure out what was going on with the flow rates. Okay? Well, and since everything they were doing was with gases, they went back to the ideal gas law and tried to come up with why they were getting things weird. And they kept getting things that didn't make sense. The instrument was saying one thing, but their calculations were saying something entirely different. Okay? And so they eventually had to go back to the person or the people that made the instrument. Okay? And they said, what the hell is going on with this? We don't understand what's going on. What did they discover? Engineers think it's pretty stupid to measure a standard temperature at zero degrees Celsius because you're never there. So what is standard temperature for engineers? Room temperature. So you mean when I change fields, standard temperature changes? Yes. Absolutely ludicrous. Standard temperature is not standard. So if anybody ever tells you you're at standard temperature, you should be like, well, what do you think standard temperature is? Okay. Once they tell you that, now you can work with it. According to chemistry, standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius. Okay. Why? Because it simplifies a lot of calculations later on that we end up running. Okay. We could just as easily have picked a different temperature, but zero degrees just happened to be a nice round number that was easy enough for us to deal with. Room temperature, the engineers picked, might be better for an actual environment, but what is room temperature? It varies depending on the room. what room you're in. Okay, so you're going to get all sorts of variations there as well. Okay, so you have to be very careful with this term standard temperature. At least standard pressure comes in and helps us out. Okay, because standard pressure is one atmosphere, okay, or the pressure that gases exert at sea level. Does the pressure change with altitude? Yes. Does it change significantly for where we would run our chemical labs? No. Okay. So standard pressure of one atmosphere was actually a, a half-decent standard pressure to pick up. 
Okay? So this equality works, and you will be responsible for using it. Okay? Just like you've been responsible for using every other conversion factor. But you have to remember that this equality is only valid for a gas at standard temperature and pressure. So if it's a liquid, don't use this equality. If it's not at standard temperature, don't use this equality. If it's not at standard pressure, don't use this equality. Okay? There are so many conditionals behind when and why you should use it that it doesn't make sense, in my opinion, to force you to memorize. Okay? Unfortunately, that's what you have to do, because okay? that is the standard curriculum requirement. What is standard pressure? Standard pressure is one atmosphere. We haven't actually defined what pressure is yet, so that makes it a little bit trickier. So I believe that's coming up here. Okay. What is pressure? Pressure is a measure of the force. Remember I said I walked into the wall. Okay. I've now exerted a force on the wall. Okay. Our gas particles do the same thing. Okay. If I have a balloon and I blow air into it, what am I blowing into it? Gas particles. What do those gas particles do? They impact the sides of the balloon. If I put enough gas particles in there, what do they do to the sides of the balloon? Cause it to expand. Okay? And I can now see that pressure, or the result of that pressure. So it is a force, and depending on how many particles are there, that force changes. Okay? So before we get into our force, let's look at a calculation. How many liters are needed to hold 2.0 grams of hydrogen gas? Okay, so let's work on this one together, mainly because I just want to move through the gas chapter faster. What am I solving for? Liters. Liters of what? <coughs> hydrogen gas. What is my symbol for hydrogen gas? H2. What am I starting with? 2.0 grams of hydrogen gas. So again, evaluate. My measurement is grams. My ending measurement is liters. So my measurement unit is changing. Is my substance unit changing? No. The substance unit stays constant, so I don't have to worry about converting the substance. So I don't need any chemical equations. I just have to deal with measurement units. Okay. So I'll have to do a conversion where grams shows up in the denominator. Okay. And ideally, what would show up in the numerator? What do you want for an answer? Liters of H2. Okay? Don't freak out and write that down yet. Do I know that conversion? No. Okay? There isn't a gram to liter conversion. Okay? So that conversion factor is invalid. I'm going to have to convert to something else. Okay? What could I convert to? Why do I want to do moles? Because if I set that up, well, number one, do I know that conversion? <coughs> yeah, I know that conversion because that's found on the periodic table. And if I ran through, I would then need to get rid of moles of H2, and I'd want liters of H2 of an answer. Do I have that conversion? Yeah, that's the dumb one I'm required to memorize. Six point makes me nervous. What is the numerical conversion factor for grams to moles? <coughs> grams to moles. That's off the periodic table. Hydrogen weighs 1.01. .01. How many hydrogens do I have in H2? Two, so this will equal 2.02, .02, assuming I did that math right. That was supposed to be kind of funny. 2.02 .02 grams, one mole. Okay. Do I have a conversion factor between liters and moles? Okay. This is the one that officially I'm required to memorize. What could you guys do? Write it on your note card. Okay. So we could say 22.4 liters was one mole. 
But before I start using that, I have to remember the conditions. What were the conditions? Has to be a gas. Is it a gas? Yes. Yeah, OK. It also has to be standard temperature. It also has to be standard pressure. What's the temperature we're, this question is asking about? They didn't, I didn't specify. What, how about the pressure? I didn't specify. Can we use this conversion factor? No. Okay. That's kind of frustrating. Okay. How does it typically get written as a question? This is verbatim out of the textbook slides. This question is a horrible question because it didn't specify that we are at standard temperature and pressure. What should you do if you encounter a question like this on the exam? Assume. One assumption or one method is just assume that Mike was an idiot and he meant standard temperature and pressure. Okay. So let's say you made that assumption and you look at your answer choices and answer choice E says impossible to determine. Was your assumption correct? No, because this question is impossible to determine as written. Okay? So be careful just assuming. If you go through and look at something and you're like, eh, I don't know, like, I kind of think I'm missing some information, what should you do? This could explain why the exams are always so quiet. You could raise your hand and be like, uh, did you mean to give me some more information for this? And that's where I might be like, smug little jerk that I am. Nope. I, I did not forget anything for this question. In which case, the answer is impossible to determine. Or I could be like, ooh, yeah, yeah, I did. That's supposed to be an STP. In which case, what am I going to do? Write on the board for everybody else that this is at STP. Okay. So you can go through a test making assumptions. Usually assumptions bite you. So ask. Okay. That doesn't apply to just this class. This applies to every class. You're taking a test and you're like, yeah, I think something's missing here. You should ask. Okay. You have to be your own defender for your own information. Okay. Which sucks, but that's life. Okay. So let's make the assumption that it is at STP. That Mike was just an idiot and forgot to, to say that information. Now what does that mean? Now I can use the equation, and now I can go through and solve. What do I end up finding out? My answer is roughly 22.4 liters. Wow, that was amazing, Mike. What is 2 divided by 2? 1. 1 times 22.4? 22.4. I don't have to use a calculator to solve this. I can approximate that and get pretty darn close, particularly for a multiple choice test. Make sense? Okay. What do you think about this one? What are we solving for? Liters of hydrogen gas. I'm doing the exact same calculation. What am I starting with? 0 0.165 grams of aluminum. Compare. Are the measurements changing? Grams to liters. Did I say the same thing when I said grams to liters? Is grams the same thing as liters? No. Am I doing a measurement conversion? Yes. Is aluminum the same thing as hydrogen? No. Which means what else do I have to do? A substance conversion. Okay. So minimally, I have two conversions to go through. Okay. So it's a question of now setting it up and trying to come up with those conversions. Okay. I don't want grams of aluminum. I'll get rid of that. Okay. Because I can't convert directly across to liters of hydrogen, 
right? both because I don't have a gram to liter conversion and the substance has changed, I'm going to convert the grams of aluminum to something else. My choice, I'm going to convert to moles of aluminum. Why do I pick moles? When in doubt, pick moles. Go to moles. Because virtually everything converts out of moles. Right? That information is found on the periodic table. Shouldn't take me so long to find. 26.98 grams is one mole. Okay. I don't want moles of aluminum. I want liters of hydrogen. Okay. Again, I don't have that conversion. So I want to try and come up with some other conversion here. I'm going to convert to the substance now. Moles of hydrogen. Why do I pick the substance? Because the moles to liter conversion, while a potential conversion, only works for a gas in aluminum, not a gas. Okay? So I'm going to deal with converting the substance. Where do I find the information to convert the substance? From the chemical equation. So I can go back to my chemical equation and say, well, there's just ones in front of everything, so ones is what I would drop in. No, why not? The chemical equation must be balanced. So I would have to go through and balance this. I need a 3 there, which wouldn't work. So it's going to end up being 3, 2, 6, and 2. Yes. Hi. You don't have to balance quite that fast, but you should be getting in the habit of being able to do so. So now when I go through and look, what shows up in front of H2? 3. What shows up in front of aluminum? 2. My moles of hydrogen is not what I want. I want liters of hydrogen. Where do I find that conversion? This would again be true if at STP. Again, crappy question because... It doesn't specify the standard temperature and pressure. Okay, so if we go through and say this is all running at STP, I could now run through and drop that information in. 22.4 liters is one mole. Okay. Referencing the earlier conversation that a significant portion of you missed, and we get some information up here, okay. this is doing three conversions. Okay. The standard method would be to memorize an equation to go through and solve. In that standard method, you now have three calculations that you have to run, so three equations to memorize. Now that you have those three equations to memorize, you also have to memorize that you can get the 26.98 from the periodic table. You also have to memorize the mole-mole conversion, which comes from your balanced equation. You have to realize that you have to balance the equation. That one's really hard. There's no equation to memorize. You have to balance it, so I'll just let that one slide. Okay? And you have to memorize 22.4 liters is one mole. That's six things that you have to go through and memorize. What did I have to memorize? Periodic table, equation, and of course I have to memorize that. For one question, I memorized half the amount of information that you had to memorize. Okay? That's a pretty big difference in my opinion. Okay? Again, that's only one question. We talked about it earlier. That was two questions. We said an exam was 36 questions. We just made the assumption that each one had to memorize one thing. This one question had six things to memorize. So for an exam, you're not memorizing 36 independent facts. You're probably having to memorize 50, 60 facts. Okay? Or you follow my process, and you're memorizing at most half of that. The process is what's important behind this. If you don't have a process, you have to have a really good memory. Okay? So, this is a much more advanced question. Typically what you see on any kind of exam for the final for this class ends up being the top one. How many liters are needed to hold 2.0 grams of hydrogen gas? Just do you know what 22.4 liters equals one mole? Okay. The next one down is a much more advanced question, typically super common in 151. Okay. So it's advanced for 130. It's what you have to do virtually every day, 10, 15 times a day in Gen Chem. Okay. 
So pressure. What is pressure? Pressure is this force exerted on things. Okay? If you punch a wall, what happens? You put pressure on the wall. You probably also hurt your hand. Okay? You're punching the stud in the wall, by the way. Okay. <laughs> okay. So since Isaiah is clearly Superman, he doesn't get bothered by it. The rest of us mere mortals probably hurt our hand. But when we punch water, did that really hurt as much? No, why not? The particles move out of the way. Because water has more kinetic energy than solids, which means when you punch them, they absorb that energy and they move. Okay? So what's happening when we go through and punch air? Well, that's really easy. Okay. Superman, yeah. <laughs> Didn't hurt at all. Okay. If we go through and take this apparatus shown here. Okay, so what someone did was fill the long tube with a liquid and then put that tube in a pool of more of that liquid. And they turned it over. Well, what happens to the liquid in that tube? Let's remove the whole bottom part. I just take liquid in the tube, okay? For instance, like, you know, a coffee cup, thank you, with liquid <laughs> in there, and I just turn it upside down. Wait. Oh, it'll... <laughs> Why are you freaking out? What happens to that liquid? It comes out. It comes out. Why does it fall out? Gravity. Gravity. Right? So, same deal. I take that liquid, I invert it. What happens to the liquid? It falls. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how little you trust. Okay. The liquid falls out. Okay. Okay. See, so we know that. What happens if I put it inside another chamber? Does the liquid all fall out? No, it doesn't. Some of it falls out, but not all of it. Why does not all of it fall out? It still has gravity pushing against it. Is it like when you... Uh... Yes. Okay. If you've ever done that game, you stick your straw in, you put your thumb over the top, and you take your straw out. Okay. You get a little bit of liquid falling out, but for the most part, it stops falling. Okay. Why does it stop coming out? Okay. There's a pressure differential. Okay. There's two things that happen as the liquid falls. Okay. Number one, you're now opening up this space. Well, what is in that space? It was all liquid before, which means... There's nothing in that space. You've created a vacuum. So that vacuum will help suck up the liquid. Okay, the other thing that helps out, that pool down at the bottom. What is that pool doing? Believe it or not, it's pushing up on the liquid as well. Really? How can liquid push up? Because if that was the case, I just had a pool of liquid. Wouldn't it come flying up? Okay. It's pushing up only on the liquid inside that tube. How is it pushing up? For that liquid to come down, what has to happen? Where does that liquid go? Into the pool, which means what happens to the pool liquid? It rises. Is there something preventing it from rising? There would have to be a force, right, pushing down on it. I don't see anything pushing down on it. Am I breathing? Yes. What am I breathing? Gas. Is there a force pushing down on it? Yeah, what is that force? The gas that we're breathing. There's a gas pressure naturally around us. That pressure is pushing down, keeping the liquid up in the tube. What happens if that pressure changes? Let's say that atmospheric pressure, that external pressure, I now put more gas around it. What happens? More gas means it can push more, which means more pressure. More pressure on this liquid means more pressure on this liquid, and what does it do? It rises. Okay. What happens if I reduce gas pressure? Well, now there's less stuff pushing down on the pool, which means 
there's less pressure pushing up on the liquid, which means our liquid goes down. Right? I have no idea why somebody thought to do this, but they did, and they probably forgot about it and left it out. Right? And what they noticed as they watched it every so often, because they were bored and they just stared at the liquid, right? and then grew really old, but let's say weather was changing. What happens when the weather changes? You hear references to high and low pressure systems. What happens with a high pressure system? There's more pressure, which means what happens to the liquid in that tube? It goes up. Low pressure systems, what happens? It goes down. Those high and low pressure systems, if we monitor them long enough, we notice that they're associated with weather patterns. And I could see rain coming in. Okay? So by looking at that tube, I could predict, oh, it's going to rain. Okay? Or, oh, we're going to have no rain for a week. Okay? And I go out and proclaim that the first time to the populace, and what do they do? Yeah, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. But then what happens? I'm right. Now when I come back and say, oh, you got to prepare, it's going to rain, now what does the populace do? They start to believe. Which, and I die. Okay. That's the creation of science. Science was now magic, based off of simple observations, allowed scientists, initial scientists, to predict patterns. Those predictions, they could then teach other people about. The same thing's happening with pressure. Okay. So we can monitor those pressure differences with weather, and that's why we have the entire field of meteorology which is not the study of meters. It's the study of our weather patterns. Right? And we can evaluate those pressure differentials and temperature changes to allow us to predict something about weather. I'm the guy that worked with the actually epidemiologist. Part-time Joe's and was like, talked to us about the weather. So it's, kind of... it's pretty nuts, the amount of science that goes in behind predicting weather. Right? And almost all of it has to do with gases because we're looking at Atmosphere, atmospheric systems, and all of those are ultimately gases. Right? And here it all ties back to chemistry. Right? So what we're looking at is how those pressure differences change. And because this was an observation we could make, we can now make an observation about gases. And they exert a pressure. Okay? The other thing that we can look at would be this concept of vapor pressure. If I take different liquids, okay, for instance, if you've seen manometers, just because it's fun to say, that monitor pressure, they're almost always mercury-based. Okay? And what we'll do is come up with standard systems. So we were measuring the height of the mercury in that tube. So the units that we use for pressure are ultimately a measure of height. Okay? The standard unit is 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay? Or if you want to move to the imperial system, 29.9 inches of mercury. And that ends up being our standard pressure. Okay. We don't use liquids such as water or ethanol. Why not? Okay. If I put ethanol in here, what would happen to the pool of liquid at the bottom? It evaporates. If that pool of liquid disappears, what happens to the pressure downwards? It also disappears, which means what happens to this liquid? It goes down. Why is it disappearing? Why is that liquid disappearing? Well, what that is is this concept of vapor pressure. All liquids naturally move into their gas state. They all do. Okay? Some do it more so than others. Mercury happens to be a special liquid in that its vapor pressure is insanely low, which means if I take a pool of mercury, what happens to it over time? Nothing. It stays a pool of mercury. But if I took a pool of ethanol and left that out, what happens to it over time? It disappears. And it disappears relatively quickly. If I do the same thing with water, water will last a little bit longer, okay, but eventually it disappears. Why? They have a natural tendency to go up into the gas state. Once in that gas state, they can now move 
and they're now away from that general sample, and that's why we eventually see it all disappear. So will like these uh, definitions like be on the test? Yes. Okay. okay. Vapor pressure is one. If you take a look at your practice final, is explicitly asked about. It's probably one of my favorite questions on the test, but it's also probably your least favorite. Uh, because it relies on knowing four different steps. Right? You have to backtrack through four different processes to get to the answer. Right? So it becomes a very difficult question to answer. Okay? So we'll come back to vapor pressure. Okay? So what are units of pressure? We talked about the height in the tube, millimeters of mercury. Okay? That works. Okay? So that tends to be a distance, so you'll see here inches mercury, centimeters mercury, millimeters mercury. Okay, those are literally just measuring the height of a mercury cylinder. Okay, but we also get ATM, which was atmosphere. I mentioned that one. Okay, we also get tor. We also get psi. We also get kilopascals. Okay, what is psi? Pounds per square inch. Okay, why do we have so many different units for pressure? The observation that gas particles exert a force was a relatively easy and simple observation. Because of that, it was discovered independently by a lot of different people. Right? All those different people had enough power that they never had to get rid of their unit system. Which means you're now responsible for dealing with the conversions between them. Okay. just like with every other measurement system. Okay. That said, I don't expect you to deal with those conversion factors because it's a relatively minor issue. The one that I expect you to remember is that standard pressure is one atmosphere. Why that one? Why that one? The number's pretty easy. It's just one. Okay. I expect people to memorize that. The rest of them, you don't have to memorize. You would be expected to be able to use them theoretically uh, on an exam. And the reason theoretically is I don't think it's a big enough deal to test on. Okay. I'd rather have you test on mass and volume and all that other stuff. Do you have to move into 151? Yes, you have to do with all those conversions. Okay. So what are things that affect this pressure? Okay. We have this new measurement system. Okay. What are things that can potentially affect it? Temperature, okay? What happens if I increase the temperature of a sample of gas? What happens to the individual particles? They speed up. They, speed up. they move more, okay? Which means what happens to the number of collisions on the side of the container? There are more collisions. More collisions means more pressure, okay? So a variable that affects pressure would be temperature, Temperature is going to be proportional to pressure. As I increase the temperature, I increase the pressure. Okay, the proportional is that weird little alpha symbol. It's not really an alpha, but that's just how I draw it. Okay, what else could affect the pressure? The volume. Okay. If I just took a balloon okay, and blew some air into it, and then I tried to expand the balloon by just pulling on it, okay, what happens to the pressure inside? Okay, it goes down. How do you know it goes down? It's not an easy one to see. Okay. It becomes a little bit easier if you say, took like a little bulb. Okay. We had a solid bulb, and let's say I squeeze the bulb. What happens to the volume of the bulb? It goes down, right? Because there's now less space because I'm compressing it. Okay. What happened to the pressure? It increased. How do I know it increased? Because when I squeeze that bulb and aim the open end at my face, what do I feel? I feel a blast of air because what's happening? I've increased the pressure in the bulb so much that what's the air doing? It's leaving. Hence, I can feel that pressure differential. Okay? So what does that mean? 
decrease volume, what happens to the pressure? Pressure increases. What else would affect pressure? I've got a balloon, right? Okay, what happens when I blow more air in the balloon? Okay, it gets bigger, right? Change the volume. So eventually what happens is I continue to blow air into that balloon. It pops. Why does it pop? Because of the pressure. I've put so much pressure, those gas particles in there, that I've increased the pressure enough that it actually broke the balloon. Right? So what am I relating? Pressure is increasing. What did I increase? <laughs> The amount of gas, also known as the count unit. What was our count unit? Moles ends up being the easier one. It's really referencing the number of particles, okay, which is moles. I right, notice for temperature I use T, for pressure I use P. Why? <coughs> Why is it easy? First letter. First letter. Volume, or sorry, temperature, T, pressure, P, volume, V, moles, M. Anybody going to have a problem if we used M as the symbol? M is not molarity. M is, I think I heard it over here. Meters. Meters. So that would be confusing, so M's out. Right, well, what about capital M? Because then it's still M. Capital M is now molarity. molarity, so I can't use capital M. Okay, we could start doing MO. Okay, or I could just write out moles. Okay, the hint on the unit we end up using for it. Moles is really a measurement of the number of particles. N. N. We end up using N as our symbol. As we increase the number of particles, we increase the pressure. So the symbol we use there is N. Okay? Well, do these things cross-contaminate, if you will? Okay? If I increase the number of particles, what happens to my volume? It goes up. Okay? What happens if I increase the temperature? What happens to my volume? It also goes up. So all of these variables are now cross-related to each other. Right? And they all have this kind of dynamic interaction. And when you read through the textbook, what they've gone through and done is compared some of those. Some people made the observation, volume is related to pressure. And so that got associated with somebody's name. I don't remember which one. Famous names are Charles, Boyle, Avogadro's is in there. Isn't there another one? I, well, I would argue it's not worth memorizing. That's why I don't know it. <laughs> but I know Charles Boyle and Avogadro. I think there's another one. but Gay-Lussac. Yeah, he's in there. Okay. So the tech... Oh, yeah, there we go. I just happen to see that you had that there. Okay. Those relationships all ended up getting named for people. So you get Gay-Lussac, pressure and temperature. Charles was volume and temperature. So someone went through and said, well, dude, you guys are all talking about the same thing. I wonder if there's a way that we can smash all of that crap together to get a single expression. Okay? And it turned out, yes, there was a way to smash that all together. Okay? What they ended up noticing is that if they smashed it all together in this fashion, PV over NT. So for any system, I measure its pressure, its volume, its moles, and the temperature. I noticed that it always equals the exact same thing. It's a constant. And I noted that it came out to be point zzz, Shows how well I remember this. 0821. What would the units on that be? Well, what's the standard measurement for pressure? What's our measurement unit? It starts with A. Atmosphere. What is our standard measurement for volume? Liters. What is our standard measurement for moles? That was dumb. Moles. What is our standard measurement for temperature? 
degrees Celsius works really, really well, unfortunately not for gases. The issue with degrees Celsius is that we get negatives, okay? And if my temperature was negative versus positive, I'm not going to get a constant, okay? It would become positive or negative depending on the temperature, okay? So I want to use a temperature that minimizes the effects of positives and negatives, <coughs> Kelvin. Kelvin being the absolute scale is only positive. I don't have to worry about it. So what we found was that this was the case. Okay? Because some people don't like seeing all that written out, somebody went through and said, well, I'm going to name that constant. I'm going to name that constant R. Or are you kidding me? It sounds like R. So really, really cool. How about that? Then it would be RR. Okay. So that is what they named it. Okay. And then someone said, well, I don't like fractions. Okay. So I'm going to change this so that it doesn't come out to be a fraction. I'm going to rewrite it as PV equals NRT. And what I have now defined is what is known as the ideal gas law. Okay. Or as you may hear chemists refer to it, Pivnert. Okay. Pivnert is what we would use for all gases, assuming ideality. Pressure times volume will always equal the moles times the ideal gas constant times the temperature of the system. This is an equation that you should then memorize. The relationships identified above are awesome. Those are fantastic. Those are phenomenal. But if you memorize Pivnert, all of them become obsolete because all of their rules are embedded in Pivnert. Okay? So Pivnert is really, really powerful as an equation. So you should spend the time to memorize it and deal with using that. Okay? What is the big thing with R? Okay? Because it is a constant, Let's say I have a gas, okay, and I change the temperature, okay, or I change the volume. I can compare those different conditions to solve for all the other variables. Okay. Or say I want to know the pressure for an unknown system. Well, if I know the number of particles that went into it, and the temperature, and the volume of said system, I can predict what the pressure is. So this equation allows me to solve for some unknown variable, which is pretty nice. Okay? It does require that I know three of the four. Right? There's four different things in there. I have to know three of them to solve absolutely for the last one. Okay? So that's kind of neat. The big thing that comes out of this is that if I have a gas at conditions A, that would be true. If I now change those conditions to become conditions B, I know it will still equal R. Okay, well, why is that a big deal? Okay. The volume of a container is doubled. Assume the temperature and moles are not changed. What happens to the pressure? So what are we relating in this question? Volume, temperature, moles, and pressure are all mentioned in here. Of those, which ones am I relating to each other? Volume and pressure, not temperature and moles. Why? What happened to the temperature and moles? They stayed constant. So they aren't going to have an effect in my system. So I could memorize whatever famous relationship that somebody stamped their name to. Or I could remember this PV equals NRT. Okay, so I have a pressure, a volume, moles, and a temperature at conditions A. Okay, I know that's equal to R. And I know that when I change those conditions that it will still equal R. So I know that this is now true. Pressure B, volume B, moles B, temperature B. 
You're like, oh, there's way too many variables. Yes, this is algebra. This is where algebra comes in and bites you, so you have to be careful with it. Okay? Can I solve for anything within that? I got one equation and, what is that, eight different variables. So no, I can't. Okay? But does the question tell me some other useful information? So the moles are not changed, right? So NA equals NB. Okay. It says the temperature was not changed. So TA equals TB, which means that purple one, PB, VB, NB we said was NA, right? TB, we said, was TA. What can I do? Cancel. NA will cancel. TA will cancel. So my expression is now PA over VA equal, or sorry, PA VA equals PB VB. That's still one equation, four unknowns. Do I have another piece of information given to me in the question? What is that other piece of information? Okay. We're saying the volume of the container is doubled. So that means volume at time B, or conditions B, is equal to twice the volume at conditions A. Pressure B will equal 2 times VA. Now what happens? VA can cancel. I wanted to know what my new pressure, okay, what happened to my new pressure. So what am I solving for? Whoops. Solving for PB. So let's simplify this out. I have PA equals PB times 2. How would I solve for PB? Divide both sides by 2, and I get 1 half PA. What is my new pressure? It is 1 half the starting pressure. Algebra does an amazing job of rearranging that and simplifying that down into a way that I can then interpret and come up with a potential numerical relationship okay, without having to say it just increased or decreased. Okay. Volume of the container is doubled, so the volume gets bigger. According to what we talked about, if the volume gets bigger, what happens to the pressure? It should decrease. Is that what I just calculated? Yep, it decreased. So I can take my initial interpretation of just knowing what is the relationship between those things and come up with a potential answer. That answer will likely eliminate two to three answer choices from the multiple choice without having to do any calculations. To nail down specifically which one, you would probably have to go through and run the algebra. Okay? Notice any parallels with this and the other stuff we've been doing? This is effectively dimensional analysis, but it's dimensional analysis with a much larger equation. Okay? It is more difficult. It takes more time to practice. It will show up on this exam. It doesn't show up on the final, so don't stress as much about that. So let's go back through and take a look at this. So a nice way to wrap up our gas laws, because I think this is the almost wrap up of it, how many moles of neon gas occupy 2.34 liters? Notice at STP. So you should be able to solve this relatively quickly. Right. We'll do it as a race. Because right. I'm going to go through and solve it too. So 
those of you looking at what I'm writing, you're probably doing it wrong. a race without an official answer, so I'll even bust out a calculator. Well, I wasn't quite ready for that. It's going to take me a little bit longer. Anybody solve it already? A whole bunch of you should have already solved this question. By the way, anybody solve it? Yeah, what'd you get? Same. Same thing. How did you solve it? Did you do what I did? No. What? So what did you go through and said? Well, you said you wanted to solve for moles, and you started with? <coughs> liters. 2.34 liters. And then you're telling me you said liters to moles, and you said 22.4 liters was equal to one mole? Yep. What the heck? Look at all I did, and look at what you did. The F is up with that. <laughs> That's not fair. 22.4 liters per mole? is true when? At STP for a gas. What did I go through and solve? Ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. That is valid. N equals PV over RT. Right? Pressure was one atmosphere. Temperature is 273 Kelvin. So you're telling me 1 times 2.34 divided by 0.0821 times 273 equals all that work? All right, well, let's pull this out. 2.34 separated out 1 divided by 0 0.0821 times 273. Guess what it equals? The exact same thing as this conversion factor. Okay? That conversion factor is an overly simplified version of PV equals NRT. This is why I think that conversion factor is useless, because it's not always true. When is ideal gas law true? Always. The method shown up top will always work. The method shown on the bottom only works when at STP. Right? This comes back to exceptions. I don't trust a method that has exceptions. I trust a method that never does. That's why I use the top method. Okay? What do you want to use? That's entirely up to you to decide. All you're really getting tested on is that 22.4 liters is one mole. Right? So it is up to you to decide how you want to go from there. We've got a couple last things on gas laws, and then we'll be moving on to the next section. And I don't remember what the next section is. Um, but we've got two more lectures to cover. I can't even tell how many slides there are on this. There we go. 17 slides. Okay, so I would bet next Thursday is going to be a review day. Because okay? our exam is the following Tuesday. Okay? So work on it, do some practice.